Thank you very much, Chris, and good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Can I start by um, just reiterating Steve's apology for not being able to be here personally. He would have really liked to be here. The reason I just thought is worth explaining, Oasis works in um, 10 different countries around the world and about twice a year the leaders of all the different Oasis countries get together and as you can imagine the, um, that, that date is set in the diary normally six, seven, eight, sometimes a year in advance and that, that's what's taking place today. They've got all the global leaders of Oasis um, over for a day so Steve does need to really give them his input and time and direction but it, it was, uh, he was very sad not to be able to be here. One of the um, great ironies is, as um, Chris was saying, I've known Steve. I've known Steve quite well since I was 17, which I think is a good two, two or three years ago now. I'm not quite sure where that 20 year <laughs> figure came from. Um, and um, I'm at the moment uh, find that I'm often standing in for Steve at things that he can't make, particularly if the topic is, is something to do with this. And I always think there's a great irony in that um, Steve is one of the people that really helped teach me not to apologise for who I am, but yet most of the time I introduce myself, I'm apologising for not being Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully I'll do an adequate job as a stand-in and you can all feed back to him robustly if not. I'm going to talk, um, as, as Chris was saying and as Steve alluded to in the video, about the Open Church Charter and why, or what it is and how Oasis has got to a place where it decided to be part of a, a, a wider group of people pioneering such an initiative. And as I go into some of the slides I've presented, and you know, you know what it's like whenever you get into work mode and, and you prepare something, you get very into the facts and you get very into the figures and you get very into looking at something in an objective way, which is, which is all good. And it's important to do those things, often to make a credible case to the outside world. But it's so easy to get into that. And... Um, and forget or, or not be conscious of the fact that actually you're not talking about stats and you're not talking about figures, but you're talking about human beings and their lives. And it's interesting that for as long as Steve and I have been working in this particular space, for which is about six years that we've been intentionally putting out um, research and, and writing and, and broadcasts on the issue of um, the church and LGBT engagement, it's so easy to see it as your job and as a part of what you do, and for me even to forget how tied up it is in my own personal story as well. So I just wanted to take a minute to remind us, and I'm sure you probably don't need much reminding of this, of, of the human faces that sit behind everything we're talking about today. The uh, Oasis Church in Waterloo, which has been going for about 15, 16 years in its, its current incarnation, has, has always had... A, a vision to be 24-7, to be open all the time so it's a constant place of sanctuary for people. It's made huge progress in that area, but it's not quite there yet, although hopefully that will change. There are people that always want to be inside the doors of the church building. There are people who, when they, at the moment, as they do, have to leave at a certain point, say on a Saturday afternoon or depending on, on what activities are going on at that point in time, who are actually quite distressed um, emotionally and to an extent you can see how it's impacting their, their physical health as well, people actually struggling to walk or leaving the building because the thought of being by themselves until church starts the next morning, which might only be a matter of hours but can feel like an eternity, is quite overwhelming. We are not the only church in central London. Uh, many of these people will be going home uh, to, to their homes, normally either in the immediate local community or perhaps somewhere else in South London, and they will pass a huge array of churches who will be running Saturday evening clubs, who will be running other activities or will be having other kinds of informal gatherings. If these people were heterosexual, and of a gender identity which society can easily understand and make its peace with, it would be very easy to just simply make them aware that these other churches are available and are open and might be a place of fellowship and a place of sanctuary over the next few hours. Because many of these people are um, lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans or of trans heritage, we cannot know for certainty that they will receive the welcome that they should. And even if we had a good inkling that they might, it would be unreasonable to expect people who have been so hurt themselves 
to put themselves at the mercy of people that they couldn't 100% couldn't be 100% sure wouldn't make their individual situation and the distress they're currently feeling even worse than it is. And therefore that's one of the reasons that we feel so personally motivated to introduce the Open Church Charter and help identify a really robust network of churches that will be able to help people in sometimes quite acute need, um, whatever their background is, whatever their sexuality is, and whatever their gender identity is. So I think it's just important to frame it in, in, our, in our own lived experience of that before diving into this. Let me just give you a tiny bit of background about Oasis. Some of you will, will no doubt have heard of Oasis going back many years. Others of you may never have heard of Oasis before. So Oasis was started in 1985 by a chap called Steve Chalk. There he is there. I imagine, I, I found that picture on the internet actually. I don't actually know what, <laughs> I don't know what year it's from, but it's, I, it might well actually be as Steve was starting Oasis or possibly even a little bit before. But Oasis was started in 1985 by Steve Chalk, who's a Baptist minister. Um, and really, in a nutshell, it was and still is all about Christians making a difference. A strong belief that heaven wasn't just something people had to wait to get to when they died, but heaven and the principles of peace and love and justice should be things that the church are trying to make happen in the here and now. And that has meant that over the years, Oasis has been involved in all kinds of projects to combat social injustice and to make communities stronger so that everybody, whatever their background, whatever their starting point, can be part of a flourishing community. And it's always done so, motivated from a, a, Christian, a, a Christian perspective. And, to be, to be frank, from, from, from a, a broadly evangelical Christian standing point. Uh, historians will debate at what point Oasis became um, LGBT inclusive, to use that phrase. Journeys don't happen overnight, do they? And I think probably each person in this room will be able to, um, would, would, give, would, would give more than a one word answer uh, to the question, when did you evolve your attitudes to, um, in terms of LGBT inclusion to the place that it is now? And it will no doubt be something that happened over a process. And that is, of course, even more true for an organisation where there's a number of people and a number of opinions and a number of voices involved in a journey. Um, but certainly, by the time that um, Oasis established the Oasis Church in Waterloo in 2003, that church was very much open as a LGBT inclusive and affirming church, which I'd previously um, been involved with Oasis and had never really stopped being. And certainly by the time I started going to that church, I was in my early 20s then and was just about confident to, um, to be open with people about the fact that I was gay and the church was, was absolutely and most certainly a place of, of love and affirmation. However, it was not for until 10 years later, um, and I think, I think and, and the reason, and I worked with, with Steve on this at the time, that, that we felt the need to, um, to write the article that Steve wrote, A Matter of Integrity, which is where he made, if you like, made public, to use, to use a slightly crude phrase, his support for um, same-sex relationships, just literally looking at that aspect of the LGBT issue. And I think the reason that we ended up doing that was not because we'd had a sudden change of heart and we thought everyone should know about it. I think we had thought for many years that the most helpful thing to do was to talk about the principle of inclusion and to talk about how um, it was important that everyone, regardless of their um, starting point, was fully included and we felt that we exhibited that and demonstrated that in the work that, that we did. But we kind of realised that nobody had noticed that that included LGBT people. Um, and, and that's why, and I think Chris, you made the point very well, inclusion means so many different things to so many people, that in 2013, Steve decided um, to write that article because he realised there was ambiguity and he realised that it was a statement that needed to be made and it was a subject that needed to be dealt with in and of its own right. Clearly, just talking about inclusion hadn't worked. So that's um, uh, something we published in 2013 and then roughly a year later, we were thrown out of the Evangelical Alliance, who decided that we weren't always better together, it turns out. Um, and um, o um, Oasis's membership 
was um, was removed, which was um, which was not necessarily um, a bad thing. We'd obviously like to be united as possible, but I think, as Steve was was alluding to himself, it was not unhelpful for Oasis to get some organisational experience of the rejection that so many LGBT people themselves had faced and to be able to, even in, in a tiny, tiny way, feel a sense of, of connectedness to that. Since that time, we've been doing a number of different things to try and um, make the church the bits of the church that will listen to us as LGBT um, inclusive as possible. We've held two open church conferences in London uh, where we've explored issues around the Bible, human sexuality, as well as some more practical issues about how you make a church uh, more inclusive. More recently, Steve's taken on the issue of uh, trans inclusion and trans affirmation, again realising that that was a very, very important uh, matter that shouldn't just be dovetailed in to the conversation around same-sex relationships, which often happens. It deserved to be treated um, in its own right and in its own merits. And earlier this year, he brought out a short paper and a video where he made a biblical theological case for the full acceptance and full affirmation of people who would identify as trans or with uh, trans heritage. And he's also, we've also been doing some wider work around how you read the Bible. We think it's um, clumsy and unhelpful to take a very traditional conservative evangelical mindset to scripture but then say ah but we found a get out clause for a few verses on same sex relationships or be it any other issue what you need to do is work out why your method of reading scripture was getting you into trouble in the first place and causing all the problems and to um to go back to first principles and um uh, a, a, and actually look afresh at how we're reading scripture which interestingly we did this before the evangelical alliance um removed us from membership and they didn't actually have a problem with that they only had a problem with us applying the method to saying that it was okay to be in a same-sex relationship our actual fundamental rethink of the way we interpret scripture was not something that they they took issue with so i thought that was a, a detail which proved how um toxic <coughs> this debate can become within aspects of the church and how hurtful that can be to the people that for very understandable reasons find it hard not to take personally and recently we've packaged all that together in forming um, the open church network which is primarily a digital platform at the moment where people can come and talk about um, theology in an open way and has a particular focus on promoting resources around LGBT inclusion. What we tried to do about 18 months ago was launch this Open Church Charter, a place where churches who were, who were clear in their inclusive credentials could sign up and um, stand up and be counted and, and almost serve as a kite mark of surety for people who are LGBT. To be honest, just with one thing or another, we didn't do it very well. And as a result, we've decided to relaunch it. And it's actually going to officially be relaunching next week. Um, so we'll be giving people a new opportunity to go through a very brief application process and we'll be giving it more publicity and hopefully giving it a new lease of life. So this is what the Charter is going to look like. We are an open church and there will be churches will be able to choose between um, the standard, um, a rainbow variant or a less colourful one. It's entirely up to them. We know that printing costs can sometimes be, um, can sometimes be a barrier. So why are we doing this? Well, the first reason that we're doing this, and uh, I'll come a little bit to talk about the, the depth of the charter in a minute, is really, and this is the primary reason, to give LGBT people certainty and surety that when they go to a church, they are going to be welcomed, and there is going to be no question about that. They can be as open as they want to be, or they can, they can take things a step at a time, but they don't have to go with that fear of when I go in, and when I, when I mentioned that actually my partners are the same sex, or I'd like my partners to be the same sex, or actually my gender identity might be more complicated than, than other people's has been, it's going to be an instant acceptance. They're not going to have to go through that horrible which is that horrible moment which is at best awkward and at times very painful, a feeling that they have to give an account for who they are or lie about <coughs> who they are. And the second reason is slightly more societal, um, to use the posh language. We um, uh, have done quite a lot of work 
in establishing a link or recognising that there is a link between the way that church, some church groups and probably the predominant Christian voice speaks about LGBT issues and the direct undermining of the mental health of LGBT people as a result. And for, I'm actually going to be talking more about the research we've done in that space in the breakout that I'm hosting um, in a little bit. So if you're coming to that one, I can give you a bit more information. If not, there's more information um, online. And of course, one of the reasons that some Christian leaders are able to stand up and say, same-sex relationships are terrible, terrible things, um, moves to liberalise laws on um, making it easier to transition your gender are terrible, terrible things, is because they're playing into a media stereotype that that's what all Christians believe. Now, we all know that that's not what all Christians believe. And actually, on the issue of same-sex relationships, where there has been quite a lot of research done, it's actually about 50-50 in the church, which would certainly not be what most people <coughs> think it is. But the more we can build a network of people who are easily identifiable as, as churches that are LGBT inclusive, the easier it will be to, if you like, break that power base that some prominent church leaders have. They can't go and say, I stand up and speak on behalf of the church in this country or globally. They can say that they speak on behalf of some churches and some Christians, but it starts to provide a ballast and a counter to all of that. So how does it work? So this is the new, slightly revamped, although not very revamped chart, because we actually thought the words of it were pretty good. You might not be able to see this, so I'm just going to read through this now. This is what we would be asking a church to sign up to. So first of all, we actively foster a culture of inclusion, openness and safety for all LGBT people, ensure that their voices are recognised, sought out and heard. So there's proactivity in that. This isn't a passive thing. It's about a church saying, not just are we going to say you can come, but we're going to go the extra mile to make sure you feel included. I should just say as well, Chris very generously said that you'd borrowed some of the text from us. I should say, this is not something we've put together in isolation by any means. A number of different groups and parties have contributed to this. And we don't think this has to be the final work either. So if anyone thinks there's something else from their own experience that could be added into here, just let us know because we think this needs to continue to develop. Every individual is encouraged to be as open as they desire about the nature of their sexuality, gender identity and relationships, knowing they will find acceptance and welcome. So it's not about saying that people have to go in there and tell everyone every single thing that's ever happened to them and every single facet of their life story. It's an atmosphere that says whatever you want to tell us about you is going to be okay. All people within our church community are encouraged to participate in all sacraments offered by our church or denomination. Um, this is trying to be as non-denominational as possible. So there'll be, it might be appropriate for some churches to expand on that a bit more in terms of what that means. But we all know, um, and Chris again alluded to this, inclusion means different things to different people. We're saying inclusion has to mean you're entitled to do everything that everyone else is able to do. So you're not barred from participating. And by sacraments, that includes marriage. Now, different churches, some churches see marriage as a sacrament, some don't. But we'll, let's be clear on this. This includes marriage. Um, duh, 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 duh. Um, all decisions about service and leadership within our church are made based on ability, gifting, and vocation. So not about sexuality, not about gender. Again, lots of people say, of course we include um, gay people, lesbians, bisexual people, trans people. We just feel that where they are in their journey at the moment, this probably isn't the right time for them to be serving in a leadership capacity. That's not inclusion. Inclusion is you treat everybody the same, regardless of, of any other factor. We're committed to offering active support to couples within same-sex marriage. There's a danger this bit could sound ambiguous, and I think we're going to carry on thinking about that. If you're and I, I'm not an Anglican, so Anglicans can jump in. If you're a Church of England church at the moment, I believe you are not legally able to offer same-sex marriage. We don't feel that every Anglican church should be excluded from this charter because of an act of parliament which they have no direct power to influence whatsoever. That's why that, that bullet point there is potentially a bit ambiguous. But this does mean people should be offered um, same-sex marriage. And when Anglican churches apply, they, and or indeed any other church, they will have to show how they're going to be able to square that circle. And it might be that it's some kind of blessing done off-site, which is they, they very clear in the community, they deem to be the same status as a marriage. We'll have to do that on a case-by-case -case basis. But same-sex marriage is part of this. 
actively listen to feedback. This has been shaped by LGBT people. I think that's important to say. This hasn't just been written by church leaders with no experience of it, but we want to carry on doing that, and we want churches to be engaging and getting feedback from LGBT people. And then just finally, really a point to say, this isn't just something we're doing as a tick box. We believe this is both an expression of what we want God, what we believe God wants us to do, and in doing this, we will get to know God better as well. So there'll be a straightforward application um, for churches that want to be part of it. First of all, they have to show that they affirm the entire charter and then explain briefly in their words how they're going to go about being as positive as possible in implementing it, how they will overcome denominational barriers to the charter being observed. What we mean by that is we know that there'll be churches who want to sign up whose denomination governance structure wouldn't want them to or who do create some structural problems we're not saying to that church don't sign up we're saying we need to just work out how we identify what those issues are the most obvious one is the church of england and marriage and then what we think the right response is so that will just be teasing that out between us how they'll speak to their church congregation about the adoption of the charter you don't have if you're going to sign up as a church it doesn't mean that every single person in your church is going to agree with it, because that's not realistic. But you do need to have thought through how you're going to have that conversation and how you're going to guarantee an atmosphere of inclusivity, even if not everybody's on board with it. And then, really importantly, how they would respond if an LGBT person came to them and said, look, I know this isn't your fault of the leadership, but someone said this to me at coffee. I found it really insensitive. My partner's very upset about it. What would you do? and just to hear how they would handle that situation. Even in the most inclusive church in the world, you can't guarantee that somebody isn't going to say something unhelpful, but we do need to get a steer for what a response to that would look like. And then, if the application is successful, um, they will have the privilege of having the logo, um, which they can put on their website. If they want to, they can put it on other printed materials and signage. Um, we'd ask them to print the text of the charter on um, on their website and by all means to evolve it. So it's appropriate to their, their local context, their denominational context, their liturgical context. <coughs> They'll then be added to a list of inclusive websites, uh, sorry, inclusive churches on the Open Church website and they will be able to get additional support from us as well in terms of speakers and training and resources, particularly if they need to take their church on the further conversation. If we feel that the charter's not right for them at the moment, or to use the slightly corporate language, if their application is not successful. I've been speaking to banks all I've been speaking to banks all week, which is probably why I ended up writing it like this. So sorry if that on, on, in the cold light of day that seems a little bit corporate. But if we feel that maybe a church needs to do a bit more work, this is this charter is not a statement of aspiration. It's meant to be a, a status that has been achieved. However, we're sure that anyone that's applying for it will have a good status of aspiration, and we will be very clear with them about why we don't think it's right for them yet, but what we can do to help them go a little bit further on that journey. So this week, um, hopefully Monday, uh, you will see information about this on this web link, openchurch.network forward stroke charter. Um, perhaps we can, we can follow up with an email with that link as well, and it would be great if you could all help spread the word in your own churches and in your own communities. I think that's it for me.